So thank you for inviting me. I'm uh, Waka Rashid. I'm a neurologist uh, based in Surrey and St. George's, and I'll try and give some joy as well. I'm here uh, to represent the briefers, to represent the ABN. Uh, so I'm deputy chair of the ABN MS advisory group. Uh, so I'm here to talk about the NHS algorithm. Uh, I will, if time, give you one or two of my non official views as well. We'll see how we go. That's roughly what I'm going to talk about. So that's the ABN advisory group who's on it. Alistair Coles uh, is the chair. And uh, there's several members in the audience today and several who aren't. Uh, but there's lots of other people involved. And there were lots of other people, there's another slide later on, who were involved in the, uh, the drawing up of the uh, algorithm, non-neurologists as well. A, a compassing uh, groups of people interested in the care of uh, people with MS. And as you know, we've had a lot of good challenges in the last 10 years or so. That's just a quick search on the NICE website of all the different things involved in MS. I've just picked out some, not all, but you can see all the different technical appraisals for medications that have been NICE approved. Diclizumab at the bottom as well. Obviously, ocrelizumab for PPMS ongoing. So there's been a huge amount of change and a huge amount of good problems. The ABN's last iteration of the DMT guidelines, 2015, obviously immediately out of date as soon as it's there, but it's been a struggle to keep up and keep pace with all that change. And that was one of the reasons for the, the algorithm. There were several others which I'll come on to. But what it, it sought to do is trying to put in some kind of order of efficacy uh, the various DMTs. So we've got loads of choice, but perhaps the, the regulation and guidelines is less clear. And I think one of the things that NHSE and perhaps in other places were a little bit concerned about was it's almost the risk of it developing into something like the Wild West in terms of prescribing, variation of prescribing, and so on and so on, where there's lots of choice. If there's only one or two drugs, it doesn't really matter if there's variation of prescribing. You can either give interferon or copaxone. But when you've got lots of drugs, lots of side effects, lots of different expenses, then it makes a huge difference. Obviously, Georgina has uh, given some uh, detail in how important access still remains. So we've got drugs, but access is still hugely important for those drugs. It's improving, but there's still gaps there. So as I think somebody mentioned yesterday, uh, quarter of a billion pounds has now been spent on DMTs. It's probably higher than that now. That's the 2016-17 figure. So it's a huge amount of money going on DMT spending by NHSE. Different drugs, obviously different amounts, and the trajectory remains up. But in addition to that is the variation. So this was uh, part of a report by uh, the MS Trust and Specialist Nursing and different teams involved. And you can see the different teams involved there and the different relative prescribing of different types of drugs. These are the different MS centers. Some, t some centers using much more injected therapies, oral, IV and so forth. So you can see that's within the UK, the difference in prescribing. Looking at NHSE spend, this is the top 10 highest spending trusts and looking per drug. And again, you can see the differences in spend for different drugs. And you can see it's not always led by a drug like alimtuzumab as to spend. And this goes, continues to go down the board in terms of the middling spending. So the next lot of spending in terms of trust, you can see some centers not even offering, it would appear, looking at the spend certain drugs. So there's a huge variation. This is what we've been talking about, variation in services, but this, and this is a variation in terms of the DMT. I think it's quite useful, and we've heard a little bit about looking at other areas, and rheumatoid arthritis, I thought, was probably a, a good sort of disease to look at in terms of experience. Lots of disease-modifying therapies, potentially expensive therapies, and again, a, a relatively active field in terms of new therapies in recent times, and see what's going on there. And I think that th perhaps the, 
slight difference here is that there is a very clear escalation pathway. There seems to be, not a rheumatologist obviously, a more clear consensus about treatment in terms of an escalation or treatment. Start on the DMT, inadequate response, you go up. So there seems to be a more seamless pathway. And obviously, we don't know that's, there is, for various reasons, we haven't got that consensus in MS. We escalate or we can de-escalate, and we're not sure which is the best approach, and it may be different for different patients. The other thing is that there is a, perhaps a more clear marker in rheumatoid arthritis, the, the DAS28, which links to response and links to treatment <coughs> escalation. And again, we have obviously aware of certain strategies, the NEDA treats target and so forth, but it hasn't got that sort of same traction in terms of therapy prescribing and nice approval in terms of how one looks at therapies. So you've got this large spend, you've got this prescribing variation, seemingly without an obvious clear consensus of treatment. And this is perhaps the background as to why the algorithm came about. I'm going to just concentrate on a few of the principles, not which drug goes where, because you can look that up and you, you're, you already know that. And obviously, we're trying to be brief. But I think the purpose was to try and get a framework, but understanding there wasn't a single right or wrong approach to this. In addition, there was no way that the algorithm could go or build on previously approved nice approved therapies. It wasn't a means to put in new therapy indications and so on and so forth. That wasn't in the remit. Uh, there's a further slide on that. In, importantly, every region should make all licensed MS therapies available. And as you saw from previous slides, possibly that wasn't happening and you may be aware in your own region, perhaps where that doesn't happen. And also the MDT. So the formalization of the MDT for patient discussion, and I think that's good for patient therapy. We still, and I personally, and I, I, I'm sure a lot of people in the audience, we're still saddled by these descriptive definitions of MS, rapidly evolving, severe, highly active MS. And again, it wasn't the purpose of the algorithm to change that. It had to go along with the existing nice definitions. And I personally, and I suspect a lot of you, feel that that is a problem, that some of these descriptive definitions of MS and how potentially subjective they are. Patients have to be ambulant. And again, there's a lot of discussion about that and where does upper limb function come into it. So patients have to be, to start in the DMTs at EDSS of less than seven. And patients come off the DMT if they become wheelchair bound. So again, that's a, a big area. I'm sure it's close to a lot of people's hearts in this audience as to what we, we need to address. The other thing as well is this, uh, and putting in stopping criteria, but it's saying suggestive suggested stopping criteria. So again, that's the thorny issue is when someone takes the person off their medication. That's the algorithm. There are, it's, and, and I think it reflects the complexity, as I say, reflects multiple agents, multiple subtyping of disease, and no common consensus about managing the disease. And so you, you get an algorithm like this. I'd say I'm not going to concentrate on the drugs in any way, but it, it's split down and we have these subtyping of subheadings. So treatment of CIS, whether with or without MRI, the different, I think, quite artificial layering of relapsing remitting MS, whether it be treatment naive, escalation in terms of intolerance, second line therapies and so forth. So it's giving a framework that's there, but as I say, it's not saying what the right or wrong approach is. That's for us as specialists, whether as part of the MDT, 
And the MDT includes different healthcare professionals, obviously, to discuss on an individual patient-by-patient -patient basis. But it is making the therapies available and funded. That's the third one on this one. There's still something about relapsing progressive MS. I, don't, I can't remember the last time I've ever done this, to be honest, starting beta interferon in this situation. Interesting, just Extavia now is funded for that. And again, when someone is wheelchair bound, it's not reimbursed. And I just put this up, there was a lot of discussion. So this went round and round for about, must have been almost two years. And several people, you know, quite reasonably trying to look and see if additional things could be added outside of the NICE indications, several things there, looking at other therapies for CIS, looking to see if fingolimod could be used for rapidly evolving severe MS. As a first, obviously it's done in Scotland, but not in England looking to see if DMF and other drugs could be used as de-escalation for nasalizumab and so on and so on. Um, but we were told, and this was uh, something that was consi consistent throughout this, if it wasn't NICE approved it, uh, in terms of the indication and reimbursement, then it wasn't going to be included. And it was for further discussion after the algorithm was out through the CRG, through that route. So those are the, the people Involved, as you can see, is a good mix of neurologists, but uh, sort of from the charities, primary care, pharmacy as well, and nursing as well. So, and there was a, I think there was, to my mind anyway, there was a lot of people involved. We got the document we got, and I'm sure we'll have a discussion about that, but there were a lot of people involved in it. The other thing as well was the placing of AHSCT on the algorithm as well. And so that's obviously current, important, recommended, offered in specialist centres when there was disease activity on high active licensed disease modifying therapy, monoclonal antibody therapy. So just to conclude, MS is, as you know, area of huge change and it's trying to keep pace with that and trying to draw regulations for that. As you know, the algorithm comes out, it hasn't got ocrelizumab in that, so it's already out of date, you could say. It's difficult to do in such a fast-moving area like MS has been. We were starting from a very low base in terms of DMT prescribing, and that's reflected, and I think, you know, we're trying to play catch-up here. And having those drugs available and reimbursed, I think, is a huge step forward. Um, there is still issues, big issues about access and so forth, which you've already heard about. We have to reflect, even though the prescribing percentages in this country are low compared to several equivalent European countries, there's still been an a large increase in spend by the NHS on this, and that's a challenge. We've got variation, as we've seen, and whether this algorithm with the MDT solves that or partly solves that, we'll wait and see. But also, as I've said, some variation is inevitable. When we're not sure the right approach on patient-by-patient -patient basis, when we've got multiple agents, and when we have got a large degree of patient involvement in the choice of DMT as well, I think some variation is inevitable. And that may be a good thing. We may learn from that. And it's important we do learn from the variation of approaches that are taken so that we can start to pick out what are the approaches that seem to work better than other approaches and build on that. So it's really important that we are, as we've heard a lot already about getting the outcomes, recording the outcomes, and also disseminating the outcomes in the community so that we are learning what's working better than other approaches. Okay, and I'll stop there. Um, just to say to um, one point about the HACT is people think it's not NICE approved um, on the neurology space, but it is NICE approved. If you go to the bone marrow transplant network, you'll see that the bone marrow transplant units have a discretionary 15% of their procedures can be used for treating uh, non-oncological indications, and MS is on that list. So there is uh, payment for... Uh, uh, so just to let you know, it is, an, it is a NICE approved procedure, and MS is on the list. Um, Malcolm's over here. 
<coughs> there was also, a, you made a point that it has to be nice approved. Not necessarily. If we make a, a reasonable yeah. case for using a particular therapy, um, uh, NHS England are very willing to um, <coughs> receive um, uh, applications or business cases for doing that. And to give you an example, we made a case about four or five years ago for using fingolimod after natalizumab <coughs> to de-risk the PML problem. And um, that, that's not nice approved, and we got it into the NHS England guidelines. So there is a way of getting yes. um, uh, things on the NHS was, England agenda I, that's not nice approved. And I think certainly now the algorithm's there. I think there was a period of time when I think we were waiting for the algorithm before more of those sort of things could come through, and now we, we've got that opportunity, I think. Any, any questions? Charmaine, where's Wallace as well? I want you to make the point you made to me last night about transparency. Thank you, Charlie. Rakan. Um, I wanted to ask about the position of biosimilars and generics. Um, Brabio, for instance, I mean, this isn't really touched up by the um, algorithm. Um, I think increasingly we'll start to see more of those. How do you plan to tackle that? Um, so, as things stand, uh, a generic biosimilar will have to do a non-inferiority study that's recognized and a funding reimbursed by NICE. That's my understanding of it. And that's certainly the case with Capaxo and Biosim. I can't, remember, I can't remember the name, but I don't know. I'm very happy if I'm incorrect in that. I think um, but there has to be a non-inferiority study done to demonstrate that. Uh, you know, it's, it's, there, there is a list of things that will need to be looked at now. This is, I think this was the first step. And then, I mean, I've not said this. Uh, I personally think we've got all this choice, but now comes the process, I think, whereby there's some logicality comes from that, uh, hopefully informed by evidence and good practice. But, yeah. Uh, so as a rule of thumb, we would expect uh, when a biosimilar comes into the marketplace that all new patients would be considered uh, for the best value biologic, which could be the originator, it depends on what the company does about their price, um, within three months. So it sort of matches up with the 90 days of a, you know, having to fund a nice guidance. And then all up to 90% 90 pa 90 of patients should be switched by one year to the best value biologic. So it doesn't have to be the biosimilar but it has to be one or two or three of the ones that are in the ballpark, because most of the biosimilars, through our experience with things like infliximab, etanercept, rituximab, there's a lot of them out there now, um, uh, they are a much of a muchness around the price. There's a, about 5% difference. So we usually allow uh, freedom of choice, but obviously at the lower end of the scale. Mm -hmm. Uh, Wallace, can I ask you to make the comment you made to me last night? Uh, so I think this uh, transparency is very important and I think that anyone prescribing MS DMDs should be accountable for, for what they're doing. And at the very least I think we should get an email each year showing how your prescribing through Bluetech stacks up with the rest of your colleagues and if not even more transparent than that. Yeah, we see these graphs about the different um, centres. I can guess which one's Queen Square because we don't we don't offer teraflunamide, so I can kind of guess where we might be and, and on on those figures. But isn't part of the moving forward bringing some transparency here? And I think Helen's point is not all about DMTs, but this DMTs are something that we can affect change because we've got all the information about, and maybe. If we focus on DMTs because it's the low-hanging fruit, maybe that will help bring up everything else in the same way that the, the experience with cardiac surgery. David? I agree with Wallace entirely. Uh, we've got all this lovely data from Bluetech, and it should not be just made um, public to us. It should be to, to patients. So patients, when they come and see a consultant, should be aware of what their prescribing rates are and who, what they are prescribing. I think patients have a right to know that. And that information should, I hope, come from Bluetech. So I think it's not just for our information, but I think it should be public, should be published on an internet site. So when you go to center X or Y, you know their prescribing habits. And if you see a consultant X or Y, you know what you're gonna be uh, uh, accessible to in terms of treatments. So I think Walsh's point is, is a very, very good one. 
So this is this is what's happening in the surgery space. You can know how you, you can know what your cardiothoracic surgeon's mortality rate is like. Helen, thank you. Um, one of the things we've done, which has been really useful in Yorkshire and Humber, is ever since we had the strategic health authorities, we've had a prescribers forum with our commissioners. So the leads for the um, five prescribing centres in Yorkshire and Humber meet with the commissioners on a regular basis. We get a breakdown by drug spend of every drug in each hospital. And I think that's been, I mean, I know it's local benchmarking, but that's been really a really helpful forum, hasn't it? Mm. Um, so we, we actually took our, our guidelines there and said this is what we're doing and this is how we've listed mm. them and part of that did get transferred across. Obviously, you know, sorry I got called out, but okay. it's, the algorithm tells you what we're allowed to do, not necessarily what we want to do and I think yeah. people need to yeah. be aware I of think that. It, as I say, this is, uh, that's, so this is the first step really uh, in terms of laying the foundation and then we build from there. I think, you know, personally, I don't think, I, I suspect no one's got a problem at all with transparency in terms of prescribing. I think it's a, it potentially is a, is a good force for change. And um, I think, uh, you know, it's up to us to then explain why there may, and there may be some very good reasons why prescribing differs in different areas. But I think it also can tell a story which could be helpful for us to look and reflect on as well, which I think is a good thing. Yeah. Okay, um, so I, I take all of the points about the um, openness and it's really important to have, I, I agree, to make that uh, data public. I think you need to be slightly careful that in, in trying to divide which drugs people use, you also provide background, not, sorry, I'm looking at you but it's not necessarily no, no, you, no. <laughs> that there's also background data provided on drug penetrance. Because it doesn't really matter what proportion of drugs yeah. people are using if only 5% of the population are being treated. So it's got, there's got to, it's got to be put in, in proportion to the population. That data needs to be in tandem with it. You can't just yeah. say that, you know, this is the amount of drug that gets used. I mean, I mean you it, can make some assumptions, but you need that data. Yeah. I mean, DMT is just one aspect of care of MS. And, you know, there's, it's about, you know, uh, diagnosing quickly enough your responsiveness mm -hmm. and so on and so on. And uh, hugely important. And uh, so, yeah, we would, definitely wouldn't want to overstate... <laughs> the importance of the DMT, I and mean, it is about the access as well, and how quickly people go on their DMT as well. I think, I think Ben Bridgewater last night made the exact point, when they put out those cardiothoracic figures, it's contextualised. Um, there's another layer of information that goes on top of it so people can interpret it, because the cardiothoracic surgeon with the worst mortality is the one who does the most difficult operations, you know, mm -hmm. we know that. So I'd, I'd agree with David's point and Neil's point, and I think you know simply flashing up some slides once a year at the ABN is probably not that helpful in terms of our practice. Um, I was going to say that you know you can I just ask Malcolm this, but you know you can see your own uh, centres data and you can see uh, your prescribing and your colleagues prescribing, incidentally, not just for MS apparently, but for other high cost drugs in, in non-MS areas. Um, but the problem is it's very clunky. So it takes ages actually. I've tr tried to look at you know, uh, what proportion of first line monoclonals we were using, for example, over a period of time and whether that varied from prescriber to prescriber. And it takes ages to do. So it would actually be useful to have a more functional um, outcome from blue tech and if you haven't got that for other prescribing areas that might be something you want to take up with either the company that provide the software or a another that can actually do that uh, Stuart Webb from Glasgow um, it's, it's just been suggested that we should be more transparent about the DMTs we use as individual pr prescribers and I agree with that uh, but I think it must be linked to outcome uh, there's no point in having um, so I work with uh, seven other uh, MS uh, neurologists uh, um, who, and I'm sure we all practice very differently in what we use. And I think probably as a centre, probably our centre is actually different to centres in Edinburgh and Aberdeen and Dundee. Um, but, but I've worked that, that way for the last 18 years, but I have no idea what, whether my outcomes are, 
are better or worse than my colleagues, or whether my centre is better or worse than, my, than other centres. And we need to have some way of linking uh, the use of DMTs to, to outcomes. I mean, this is one of the and things that... it can't that just be with EDSS. It needs to be something which is relevant to the patients yeah, sure. in terms of uh, their employability, their, whether their separations, or, um, their ability to walk, and bladder function, and so forth. So, so Jackie Kemp, um, at a meeting I had at the King's Fund, uh, it was earlier this year, said we as a community must come to her when we've got the outcomes that she wants and the audit tool and the quality metrics that we collect, and then she will make it a point of mandating, putting it, make it mandatory for the MS community to do that. But um, So I said to her we couldn't come straight away because we hadn't got consensus on this, but she's absolutely up for mandating that every single person with MS in this country has outcome measures collected every year, and every single centre has to do a quality audit every single year and send their data centrally. And uh, this is how you change um, the outcomes. And, and so this will happen. NHS England is up, up for this, but we've got to go to Jackie Kemp when we're ready, maybe after this meeting in six months' time, and say this is what we want to do. And she said she will implement it within reason. <clears throat> she said it's got to be very simple, though, because the, uh, it can't burden uh, centres. Um, <coughs> The question is, will Scotland adopt what the NHS England puts out? We need, to, um, we need to do it for a positive reason. We need to look for outcomes and, and, and see how that uh, reflects how we use our treatments. I, I we think need we've to got use it for, for, for a gain. So if my, if my performance is, isn't as good as my colleague, I need to learn from my colleague. We've um, got an opportunity, I think, through the MDT and discussion of, and with several clinicians involved in that. And part at the moment, it's growing up, I and mean, it's just purely a tool uh, in s several areas, I think, to look at eligibility of patients for certain drugs. But I think it could evolve to try and answer some of those questions in terms of actually looking at the follow-up and seeing about different approaches. So I think, you know, uh, w whether through an MDT or whatever you call it, so then it needs to be, again, within units sort of discussion and transparency about perhaps what's working well and what isn't working well in terms of approaches. Colin's point is uh, very, very important here, the outcomes. And uh, currently we're using, uh, we talked a bit about last night about Blue Tech putting EDSS scores on. Um, and we've talked a lot about the lack of resources. We've all stretched. I don't think any centre, well, our centre, uh, we're a tertiary referral centre, we can't do EDSS in everyone. I think what would be a much more sensible approach is looking at employment status. That on a Blue Tech form, that'd be very easy to do, just for you know, whether they're employed. So part-time, stop working because of their MS, or stop working for other reasons. That would be a much better outcome measure, much easier for centres that are very busy just to click on. I so I would propose that you know, Blue Tech switches from EDSS, I or puts yeah. estimated EDSS, and instead puts something about employment. And that would be very quick to do and very easy to do. Uh, yeah, I, th I think, you know, there's several approaches one could do. I personally <coughs> would, would look at the SDMT or something like that, but, you know, there's several options out there if we decide that the EDSS is not feasible, but obviously then it has to be linked up with, with Blue Tech and it has to be reliably carried out, and that's obviously the purpose of meetings like this, isn't it, to, to discuss. But the outcome measures like the S S SDMT and EDSS, uh, they, don't, they correspond a bit to employment. And if we're looking at um, outcomes that are important to the society as a whole and to be cost-saving, then I think the, the most effective way is are people staying at work? Because um, that's of benefit. Pay, they're paying yeah, tax, it's, they're paying you know, it's, it's a good discussion. Because uh, we're always saying, I go to lots of meetings and always, or, you know, when you hear presentations and trials or whatever it may be, and we're always, there's a deficiency in the outcomes or, and so on, and I think you know that's there is an urgent need. I think to have, a, particularly on what's been said from NHS England as well, for a, a need for agreement on that. Can I, um, just add to that. I mean, I'm passionate about um, employment, and it's one of our big areas of research and keeping people with MS in work um, who want to be in work and mm -hmm. who are able to work. But, I mean, I was talking to Kate about this earlier on, and you've got to bear in mind that some areas of the country, employment isn't that easy. Exactly. There aren't that many jobs it's around. Just, for me, there's and, too many factors involved. And so we so just need that. to take that into account, actually, in, in areas of the country when there's very low employment mm. rates. Um, 
then and changing, you know, changes in that population, more and more deprivation. And also that some people with MS will make a positive decision to leave yeah. the work workplace or they'll make a positive decision to become part time. So there's just those caveats in there for that. Kevin? To um, I'll link the last two talks, actually. Uh, so I think transparency is key, and I, I agree that we should be open about what our prescribing practices are. Um, one thing that we have noticed in our trust, and I'm not sure what the experiences of others are, an increasing number of freedom of information requests that are burdening our MS specialist staff and other staff members, taking away time from actually delivering patient care. And clearly, these are being requested by key stakeholders. Now, if we're gathering data, and the data is meaningful, and we want it to be transparent, I think we have to work as a community with all stakeholders at the table to understand a way to have it available in a systematic and straightforward way, such that it doesn't burden teams with multiple duplicative requests that don't add value to care. <clears throat> yes. So, the, I mean, to be honest with you, that's a third party provider that gets this information and they sell it off to the pharmaceutical industry yeah. at a big cost. Yeah. And, the, I, and I personally don't think the Freedom of Information uh, uh, Act was created to monetize uh, information in that way. And so we as a community should push back on this. And, you know, it's absolutely, I mean, the, the last Freedom of Information request took how many hours to get? Over two weeks. Two weeks. You can say no if it's unreasonable time. <coughs> Yeah. Anyway, we, yeah. we, we're running out of time, so I'm, um, the, the, I think the blue tech discussion has, has got to happen. So uh, let's get. Thank you very much, Walker. Thank you. Let's get Malcolm on. Thank you.